Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight at this, the 43rd annual Michelson Memorial Lecture. This annual lecture is one of the highlights of the academic year, and it affords the chance to hear from some of the world's most renowned scholars who, like Albert Michelson himself, make significant and long-lasting contributions to those fields. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Julio Otino, is no exception, and I know you'll very much enjoy this evening with him. Before we introduce our speaker, I first would like to thank the class of 1969 for their most generous sponsorship of this lecture this year and every year. May I please ask the members of the class of 1969 to stand so that we can recognize them for this contribution. Thank you so much. Um, as is our custom at the start of the Michelson Lecture, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about Albert Michelson, the man who's, in whose name we host this lecture series. Albert Michelson is a Naval Academy graduate from the great class of 1873. Thank you. Albert was born in Prussia in December of 1852. His family emigrated to the United States when he was only two. They settled in Nevada, and eventually moved to San Francisco where he completed high school and he set his sights on the Naval Academy, but he did not succeed at first in getting a nomination. So he came to Washington DC, had a face-to-face -face meeting with President Ulysses S. Grant and received the 11th out of 10 special appointment slots to become a member of the class of 1873. Here in Annapolis, he excelled in his studies, but in fact, he was so uh, advanced in his work in optics that he was accused of cheating. But he had to exonerate himself by coming before the oral board and doing an oral examination where he proved that no, really, he just really understood optics <laughs> at that level. Um, after a tour at sea, serving in the North Atlantic Squadron on the USS Worcester, he returned to Annapolis and taught physics and chemistry. In 1877, while preparing for class, a demonstration of Foucault's measurement of the speed of light, he discovered how a modification of the experiment could dramatically improve the accuracy of the measurement. And for this measurement uh, and this improved accuracy, he was the first American to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics, which he received in 1907. His formal result was measured along our old seawall, where fittingly the two science buildings, uh, math and science buildings, Michelson and Chauvenet now stand. The location of his experiments are now marked by aluminum disks embedded in the terrace between those buildings. And just last week, USNA was recognized as a historic site by the American Physical Society uh, for having the site of this experiment. Now, I love this part of Michelson's story for many reasons. Um, uh, one reason is he embodies in one individual the combination of scholarly excellence and military professionalism that we've cultivated in our faculty since 1845. I also really like to highlight how Michelson made this great contribution not uh, in an isolated ivory tower, but as uh, in working with his class and thinking about how to teach physics to his students. So he clearly embraced active learning, which is a pretty 21st century pedagogy for the 19th century. What a thing it must have been to have Albert Michelson as your physics prof. Now, after completing his tour as an instructor at USNA and his service in the Navy, Michelson went on to what is now um, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and there, with his colleague Edward Morley, he invented a device called the interferometer. In cooperation with Morley, using the interferometer, he showed that light travels at a constant speed in all inertial systems of reference. Now, let me explain that a little more. Um, physics theories up to that point postulated that just as water waves move uh, through water and sound moves through air, that there must be a medium that light was moving through, and that was called the luminiferous ether. Um, and it was a widely held belief that this ether existed. Um, so, but because light can travel through a vacuum, it was assumed at the time that a vacuum must contain this ether. So the Michelson-Morley experiment was designed to confirm the existence of lumin luminiferous ether by measuring the change in the speed of light. And of course, they did this experiment and they, uh, the experiment failed. They couldn't make a measurement because, of course, there is no such thing as luminiferous ether. So it was, at first, a failure, but it turned out to be a great success. It, uh, it 
a success. It pr instead of providing, it, it, it provide insight into uh, the, uh, this revelation that we had misunderstood this fundamental theory and triggered a revolution in physics and a new way thinking of thinking about science and energy. So Michelson's story is not only uh, one of scientific genius, but it's also of courage. Courage to question conventional wisdom and to follow where the data leads. And it's a, courage, a story of resilience, of how what appears to be failure is often the critical first step towards great success. I would like now to invite Captain Shoup, the Dean of the School of Mathematics and Science, to please introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Who ya? Yeah. Provost Fireball, thank you for introducing Michelson, the lecture series, and also Michelson, the Nobel laureate, so well. Thanks also again to our distinguished class of 69, and may I say 69 is mighty fine. Who ya? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the class president, Steve Comiskey, is here. Please raise your hand. So, again, for, thank you for your leadership. He's been, a, he's been a, 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 he's pulling a steady strain for the Michelson Lecture for a long time, as have many of the class, and we appreciate you guys attending these and supporting this academic endeavor. Um, it is my honor and pleasure tonight to introduce the Michelson guest lecturer, Dr. Julio Otino. Here at the Naval Academy, the appearance can be that there is a sharp distinction between art and science. We are here to teach future officers how to navigate the technology utilized in our ships and aircraft and equipment. We spend little time on art, and even our non-technical majors graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree, as all of the midshipmen here know. Uh, yet, you don't have to look very far to see the connection between science and art. We have lots of examples here on the yard. I have personally witnessed Dr. Shirley Lin, uh, who's chemist extraordinaire, also jam on the keyboard uh, during many events. Um, Dr. Paul Mikulski, uh, who is the chair of the physics department, um, is equally versed in, wait a second, I had to look this up, equally comfortable discussing packing N-alkane monolayers and blues guitar, which he is phenomenal at, by the way. Uh, also, our very own provost, who is both a microelectronics expert and a professional musician uh, who plays at local clubs. Check her out. But can there also be a relationship between science and visual art? Can they be mutually reinforcing? The answer, of course, is yes. And there is no one better to explain how this unity can exist than Dr. Otino. Dr. Otino served in the Argentinian Navy. As a trained chemist on his first ship, he decided that the facilities he had to do chemistry were subpar at best and produced a full report that went up to his chain of command on how to fix everything. The CO was not pleased. <laughs> but this was Dr. Otino demonstrating his unique perspective and individuality from the beginning. Also, it is notable, while serving in the Navy, Dr. Otino staged a solo art exhibit while being a naval officer. Uh, I have never heard of that happening before, so that's probably a very unique uh, experience. Artists practice their craft for their entire lives and maybe, maybe eventually get a solo art exhibit like that. Uh, and while in the Navy, Dr. Otino did it as a collateral duty. Very impressive, sir. Uh, as a McCormick Institute professor, a Walter P. Mercy, Murphy professor of chemical engineering, a professor of mechanical engineering, former dean of the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and a professor of management and organization at Northwestern's Kellogg School, Dr. Otino has been exemplifying the connection between artistic creativity and technology while simultaneously studying it his entire career. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, a recipient of the Bernard M. Gordon Prize for Innovation in Engineering and, Technological, and Technology Education, a Guggenheim Fellow, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Science. And that's just a few <laughs> of the things that he is. His research has been featured on the covers of Nature, Science, Scientific American, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, among other publications all of which means we are in for a very interesting evening. Please join me in welcoming our Michelson guest lecturer, Dr. Julio Otino. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Is this on? Okay. I want to thank Captain Shoup for those generous words, the class of 69, and also you kind of circle these invitations, the math department. Um, I very much enjoy explaining things, and I will especially enjoy this. I have talked with enough graduates of the Naval Academy, people who have achieved prominent positions, to conclude that there is something special with education here. So hopefully I will be able to convey one or two points that you may remember out of this presentation. So the, the idea is to show unity of knowledge. So these lessons on innovation, creativity, and leadership, because at the end of the day, what you're learning here is leadership. And I will talk about the nexus of these things, science, math, technology, and art. You, you could argue that these domains uh, encompass a lot of the accumulated creativity of humanity through history. There are things that are not here. For example, I'm not listing parts of humanities, but let's go with this for a moment as some big, big components of accumulated creativity through time. So the main question is, what is contained in these domains? Okay. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say, you could have a much longer discussion, so, but I want to hit some main points in here. So you have science, technology, and art. And I'm putting science on the left, because I'm going to use the word left brain by being analytical, rational, logical, sequential. And art on the right, right brain. The brain is more complicated than this, but this is a metaphor, OK? As divergent, creative on the right. And technology, by the way, in any way that you look at it, technology is always bracketed between art and science. So the words that go with science, you could argue that the, the driver for science is discover or explaining. Technology, something is going on there. <laughs> uh, I don't know how long it will take. In technology, the operating word will be invent. And in art, I will put, so let me kind of retake that for a second in here. So where does math fit? I'm going to go very quickly, OK? There, there are people in math which are visual, non-visual. The whole point in math is you prove something, you destroy all the scaffold. And this is what makes it so hard to know where ideas came from. And so math, I would say, part is and mathematicians are divided half and half in between Platonist and not. Um, some is creation, but some is discovery. The Pythagoras, the Pythagoras theorem was always there. You just found it, OK? Uh, and they are not shy about how much imagination you have to have to do math. Uh, Mike, uh, David Hilbert, one of the greatest mathematicians, uh, he was asked about a former experience. He, said he did not have enough ima imagination to be a mathematician. He's now a poet, and he's doing fine. OK? So but then in the middle here, applied math will be here, OR will be here, bridging those two things. And computer science, theory will be here. But then computer science goes all up to there. And in fact, there are people who have written books like uh, comparing computer science with art, real art. Engineering is clearly science and technology, but I would argue that when you put, start putting design, it's all across the board. So we are talking about thinking modes in here. This is what I was referring before, and this goes to individuals and teams, OK? So now, the thinking mode in technology, I could have picked anything else. I mean, pick. Uh, any technology, you could pick I don't know, ships from 1860 up to now. You can tell me, for example, these are clearly ways to store in data. 
uh, even if you come from outer space and you ask questions, you can see that things move from here up to there. So in technology, there is a concept of progress. So it's in science. In science, if I show a series of discoveries and you can see the layers of what was before how things advance. Uh, for example, sometimes there are transitions. This happens to be in Milwaukee at the Harley Davidson Museum, and this is a nice little transition. This is a 1912 Harley Davidson, one cylinder, leather belt. 1912, 13, they changed to two cylinders and they stay there. Maybe they change the angle a little bit and they change belt. But you can say this probably came after. Okay? So in, in technology, there is this direction. There is a concept of progress. The same in science. But what, what about visual art? And I'm talking about modern and contemporary art in here. So before, before this, let me kind of go to the detour that I was making reference. So this is the picture of the man himself, Albert Markelson. And uh, 65 years before, which would be my next slide, the discovery of Neptune, which I'm going to refer to, he said, our future discoveries must be looked for in the sixth decimal place of decimals. And he was obviously influenced by some discoveries, like the one that I'm going to mention, that depended on extreme, extreme precision. Okay? Uh, and this, there is no record of his saying this. There is a record of this guy Millikan, who is now persona non grata in Caltech, they eliminated the name from the library in Caltech, but he was there, he was a protege of Millikan, and he said that Millikan said this, and I went into the records of the University of Chicago and he's there, because Michelson also formed the department in the University of Chicago. So what was the precision that he was talking about? The precision was that in the 1940s, the planets that people knew were up to Uranus. But Uranus was not behaving exactly as Newtonian mechanics predicted. He had deviations of 30 seconds out of 360 minutes, okay? 30 seconds only. And this is very complicated story. This woman, uh, June Barrow Green, wrote an entire book about it. There were two astronomers Le Verrier in France and John Couch Adams in England, who one of the hypotheses was there has to be a planet unknown to us that is the cause of these disturbances. And they back calculated everything, and at some point they announced if you point a telescope in this direction, the cause of the disturbance will appear. And voila, Neptune appeared. So, as a result of that precision is where Michelson was influenced. There were several discoveries based on this degree of precision. Now, the odd thing is that out of this precision came a, a, a race to solve what it was called the three-body problem, because all the calculations were approximations. There was not analytical solutions. And so there was a big, big price and money invested about who could solve the three-body problem. And the one who showed that basically couldn't be done was this fellow, Henry Poincaré, who was a great mathematician of his time, because he is the one who discovered what was the basis of chaos. No one at the time regarded this as significant. He won the prize, but he won it for kind of a negative result. It's, almost the same story of Michelson, showing that there is no ether, okay? So, and this is the, what he put in there, that the, the butterfly effect and all of those things come from these statements in there, okay? A small differences in initial conditions, great in the final phenomena, but this was an unnoticed sigmic change. So this is Poincaré when he was young. He died very young at uh, 55 or 58, but Poincaré influenced a lot art indirectly. And in there you have people like the one on top, Schufret, who they were people who wrote popular books 
explaining the idea of four-dimensional spaces and things like that. The idea of Poincaré kind of penetrated more the culture. And, and there were people who, looking at you, Fred, this guy, Princet, uh, he was in the circle of Apollinaire, uh, Jan Metzinger, a painter and also a critic and a theorist, and Marcel Duchamp, one of the great artists of the 20th century. And all of those kinds of words reach the, what became the Cubists, people like Picasso and Braque, okay? And in here you have, this is Metzinger, who wrote this book about Cubism, the theory of Cubism. And, and there you have a room that happens to be the drawing room of Niels Bohr in Copenhagen. And Niels Bohr, he could pick, he was treated lavishly by the Danish government. He could pick any painting that he wanted to decorate. He picked this cubist painting that was actually from this fellow Metzinger. So, and why did he pick this painting? It's, he said that he used the painting, is the woman on the horse, it's called, La Femme au Cheval, to explain the concept of complementarity to visitors, that depending on how you look, things you see one thing or another one. And there's a lot that can be said in here that one of the phrases is, if cubism is the result of science in art, then quantum theory is the result of art in science, okay? That this, you can keep going in here, it's probably pushing the things too far. So why visual art? Why I'm bringing visual art? So in here I have two of what are more than 40, 45 sketches that Picasso did of what became Guernica. Used to be in the moment New York, now it's at Reina Sofia in Madrid. We know everything that he did because his mistress at that point took pictures of all of them. That's, so this didn't appear magically, they are all of those things. So in art, Things don't appear out of nowhere. There is this evolution that you see, which you don't see, for example, in math. You don't see all the drafts of the papers of uh, Riemann before the final result is there, and you have to contemplate it's perfect, but you have no idea how it was started. So the trail in art, and this is the part that is the most surprising. People equate art with creation, inspiration, epiphanies, not such a thing. Uh, the inspiration exists, for example, Picasso said, but it has to find you working, okay? You work all the time. So the trade survives. So let me kind of make the point, hammer the point, that the, the, the arrow of progress that you saw in technology, you cannot see it in art, okay? So I let you watch this. If you have taken courses in modern art, you may be able to tell me which one is the oldest painting, which one is the newest, and in fact, there are two paintings that are done by the same person. Maybe if I show you the portraits of these people, of self-portrait. By the way, this is not out of focus. This is how Richter presented himself, and this is how Kandinsky draw himself. And I ask you, again, oldest, newest, very hard. Okay? In fact, this is the oldest, that's the newest, Basquiat, Kandinsky, these two, that they don't look like they were made by the same person, is Gerhard Richter. Okay? I can show you something else. I can show you products of design. Every architect and designer of note design a chair. But again, it's very hard to tell put them in a chronological order, which you could do with technologies or science. So the why visual art is because they know a row of time. And this is what I said before. Technology is continual adaptations with disruptions. Science builds over the past. The disruptions are infrequent. And art is constant reinvention. So this is what I told before. In science, good strategy to stand on the shoulders of giants. That's how you build papers. In technology, just to crush the elder giant in art by idea to stand next to anybody. So you have this 
simplification that I have in here, the whole brain metaphor in which you have the two different modes of thinking, the, the, the left brain kind of thinking. People are more complicated than this, but let's, in which logic, analytical, convergent parts, and then you have the creative, metaphorical, all, all the other parts. And, and these are two different ways of seeing the world, okay? And this is why the conflict sometimes in how you see it if you put one lens or the other one. And this applies to individuals and teams. You can have a team that is kind of whole brain, or you can have a team that is completely on one side or the other one. So next to thinking requires dealing with opposite viewpoints, which is a good thing. So improving creativity, uh, let me make a kind of very quick comment about AI. So in AI, you mine a domain. In fact, you can have everything that is known by humanity. Now people have run out of things to mine from the internet, and they're mining I know, Facebook and YouTube now. Uh, so this is what is known about a given time. And the, the way that things happen now, depending on questions that you ask, you have two ideas, and you come up with a new idea there. That is completely immersed in here, because the two ideas were there. And I will call this combinatorial creativity, OK? is all anchored in the assumptions that they were in the domain. Now, this is the frontier knowledge in here. The adjacent possible comes from Stuart Kaufman in biology. So it's, it, biology evolves little by little. You don't go from a starfish to a hippopotamus. You go little by little. And some people try to even monetize the idea by getting really smart people together and see if you can go to the next step, OK? So, and you produce breakthroughs. A breakthrough is something that breaks through the domain, enlarges the domain, um, but is anchored on the ideas of the domain. A break with is what I would call transformational creativity. You are in physics, energy was continuous, Space and time were separate, and now you come with space-time, energy is continuous. You have no option now. You call the old thing classical physics, and you call the new thing new physics, and then it's all physics. That's transformational creativity. And the question is, can you produce transformational creativity when all the elements that you are using are based on a set here? So this is something that there is much more to talk about, but I will just leave it here. So let me give you these two examples of things that are out there and I would say would be hard to extract by asking just questions. So origami has been with us for 800 years, OK? At some point, maybe in the last 50, mathematicians discovered that there was really nice math in origami, and then engineers found the ideas very attractive to the point that is now a discipline called origami engineering, OK? And you don't have to be really super smart to imagine that now you can pack something in the size of this podium, and you can unfold it in a space the size of a, a tennis court. And, but this was always there. Okay. In the same way that tensegrity, the idea that you can have elements that act, reinforce each other in compression and extension, uh, produces sculptures like this that is very close to here. It's in the Hirschhorn Museum in Washington that looks like defies gravity. Okay. Uh, this has been around since about the 20s. This is a picture of an exhibit that an artist from Latvia did. And now, if you show this to people in material science, they discover that, wow, there are probably ideas for metamaterials in here. Biologists have discovered that biology has been using the concept of tensegrity since the beginning of time. But it was there. So I mentioned these two examples of things that are out there, have always been there, and they have now newly been discovered. But what questions could have led to the discovery of this? The question could not have been, 
oh, tell me if there is interest in math in origami. That, that the question more or less gives you the answer. OK? So these are things that I mentioned, are things that they were in the category of almost break with, that they were available. I do not know if AI now is equipped to produce something like this. Because there have to be other things in this class. Now, let me make you a couple of comments about complexity before going to more the conclusion. Explaining complexity. And I need to explain the difference between complicated and complex. Okay? A complicated system is a system that is designed with a blueprint. You know where every part in the design of a jetliner will go. Okay? And probably a nuclear sub. Okay? And a clock will be the prototypical example of a complicated system. And if you don't want things to fail in here, maybe you need to back up important components, because if a component fails, the other components are not certainly morph and use, replace that component. In ecologies, that happens. In biology, that happens. Uh, that's why you have stem cells, for example. And in this e e column, I have an example of complex systems. Complex systems are systems in which the elements, you can study a fish to death, and you'll never be able to deduce from studying a fish that they form schools. Or you can study a neuron to death, and you'll never understand how they connect together to form a brain and produce consciousness. That's the difference between these two things. So complicated systems have a, a blueprint. Every part fulfills the function. There is even a manual for repairs. In complex systems, they are adaptable. They fail more gradually, OK? And they are more contextual. They could be a, an element that could take the function of another one in an ecology. They fail more gradually. So this is a complicated system. A BW, probably 1940. This starts getting more complex because it's embodied with some AI. And there you have something. When you put many cars like that, drivers, environment, that you complex. So you go from this to that. And the key thing here is the going from here to there is emergence. Emergence is what happens. It can be good emergence and bad emergence, OK? If you are uh, running an organization, you want to produce a culture where good emergent things happen more than you are putting in, in OK? So complex systems have nonlinear. They have tipping points. They are resilient, evolve. They, are, they have feedback. They benefit from, well, I'm not going to ask you this, but if you click in there, you can find some toy examples of examples, OK? So there are lessons from complex systems that we have accumulated over the years. Simple behaviors produce complex outcomes. But there are lessons like chaos and order can coexist. And in fact, these are the ones that I want to focus on. Organization can occur without central control. This doesn't mean that you throw your arms up and you don't put any organization. But it could be that for some components of a creative industry, you want to relax the grip and produce conditions where that emerging behavior producing creative behavior will come up. So the key to understanding all of these things, chaos and order and emergence, is to be able to see simplicity in complexity. You go from something that has lots of parts and you identify the central idea, and also going from simple to complex, how one idea can contain lots and lots of consequences. A typical example would be, have been the paper from Watson and Crick about DNA, 900 papers. Probably one of the last sentences of the paper was something along the lines of, it has not, this is the, the double helix paper has not escaped our attention that the model proposed here can have interesting biological consequences. Well, all biotechnology emerges from there. 
uh, but it would be impossible for people to see it in the same way that the first person who did a transistor couldn't see the consequences of that idea. So let me hammer the idea in this way, the simple. So these are lithographs from Picasso, uh, all in the period around 1944, 45. And I showed them too quickly for you to have noticed the date. But if you look at the date, the way that Picasso did this, this was the first, second, third. There are 11, but I'm showing only eight. And this was the last. Simple to complex, complex to simple. The idea of the two conflicting viewpoints, quantum mechanics, uh, light, wave, particle, the ability to synthesize opposing viewpoints. Simplicity and complexity, sometimes they can coexist in some things, chaos and order. Uh, in organizations, how much you want blueprint or emergence, you want all blueprint, you want to have some leeway for people to generate more ideas. So creativity emerges from a conflict of ideas, okay? So we go through life uh, looking at things with one pair of glasses, often very, very successfully, okay? But having the possibility of another, an, adding another pair can enrich our thinking, okay? Uh, so, let me just, I'm going. So, what's the advantage of looking at the world with two lenses. And it doesn't mean completely converting to the other side. It's basically understanding one thing, okay, that I will make clear. First, let me give you some lessons that cross domains, just to hammer things, okay? So these are lessons from art. Visually, they are clear, so let me give you a few. This one we saw. Simple, complex, complex, simple, okay? This is another lesson. This is a sculpture that is in New York. It's called Baboon and Young from Picasso. But if he did this with all objects that he assembled together that they were just lying around in his studio. So for example, the head of the baboon is two toy cars. The, the ears are the handles of a, a Max or pitchers or something like that. They were pots and pans. But once, once you see how the things are integrated, the individual parts disappear. So the lesson in here is adapt and adopt. Once you see the whole, the individual pieces disappear. But Picasso said, bad artists copy, great artists steal. Steal the parts, not steal the whole thing, okay? and you put it in a way that is uniquely yours. This is, there are five things in here which are all very similar. That they were sketches of Matisse that resulted in this that happens to be in St. Petersburg at the Hermitage, okay? But you saw, again, the same thing. This didn't happen, there were lots of uh, stages that gave rise to this. But I mentioned before the one of inspiration exists but has to find you working. So Matisse didn't go to paint when we inspired. He went to work every day and he worked until early 90s, okay? But some days he was not particularly inspired and he painted what he had in his studio and in this painting, he painted this painting that was lying in the back. And again, okay? So what's the lesson here? Inspiration is overrated, okay? You have to work constantly, okay? And this is what people think that artists sort of only do things when they are inspired. No, they just work. So. Why I am focusing on the lessons that cross domains in here? The key is not to convert 
yourself in another person, the key is to understand how others think. We tend to confuse the outcomes of what they do with that domain. But understanding what's the process that led to that outcome is the key thing in establishing communication and understanding and benefiting from that understanding. Understand how others think. So the only way to augment our thinking spaces okay, is to understand how others think. And it's the only way to increase the size of the connected network of ideas that we have in our brains that probably will give us a much richer set of possibilities for creative solutions. And the only way to augment the thinking spaces is that one. Understand how other things increase the size of the network. And I firmly believe that some of the best ideas happen at intersections. I gave you two examples, the origami one and the tensegrity one. They have been there for hundreds of years in one case, hundred years in the other one. Someone saw the connection and drew consequences. But there are many more like this. I, if I knew what they were, I will be telling you. Okay? So we go through life looking at things with one pair of glasses, often very, very successfully, but having the possibility of adding another pair enriches our thinking. That's the main message that I want to give you. Thank you. And basically, everything that I said is somehow contained in this book. And if you want more details, you can go to that website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Atino. I think we have a few minutes for questions. So if anybody would like to ask any questions, we have a mic set up in each of the two aisles here. Okay, there is a brave person there, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you, um, sir, for coming today. Uh, this is Mitchum Second Class at Viva Steha from Seventh Company. Mm -hmm. Um, sir, it's amazing that you can come up with the idea of a nexus, but my question is how do you arrive to this conclusion through your personal achievement? Was it a result of your experiences um, between science, the military, your interest in art, or was it like a key moment that, or a key person in your life that was like, this, this is how everything is connected. In no, I, I, I give you two, two answers. <laughs> One more kind of the exterior answer and one more the interior answer. The exterior answer is I was blessed. Uh, my father was a professor. I grew up surrounded by microscopes. I saw the science part. He, he was in histology, embryology. And my mother was training classical art. So I saw those two things. And you learn a lot by osmosis, OK? So that's one answer. The other answer was that I grew up in a time in which things in Argentina were really, really, really chaotic, OK? Uh, and the most chaos was reached when I was in the Navy there, OK? There was, and I had two sides to me, OK? One was the perfect, in Greek, the Dionysian, sorry, the, the Apollonian side of perfection. And to me, math and physics was perfection. And I went into that. And the other one was more the Dionysian world, OK? Uh, and I gravitated to things like Kafka and Dostoevsky and all of those kinds of things. And I never really got into politics who could have got me killed, OK? <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, uh, so at some point, I, the two things kind of connected more. And I remember one case. Very early on, I was invited to give two talks in Puerto Rico. They had a series of talks sponsored by uh, Merck, 
the Merck lectureships. So I was giving two talks. And someone called me from there and said, by the way, we have the meeting of Sin Masai. It was very early on. Uh, would you have a talk for the whole university? And then I, I said, well, maybe, I, maybe someone will be interested in these things about I don't know, art, whatever. And I put it in there, and the rest is history. But a lot of my more serious work is always influenced by some visual image. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Good evening, sir. Mitchip and fourth class, Carl Boiler from company 23rd. The question I have was in regards to technology. Right now, big technology companies are putting a hindrance on emerging new technology platforms because they, they're able to buy them out. Do you think this has an adverse effect on the future and innovation? Sorry, repeat the second part. The big companies are doing what? They are buying these small companies. And yeah, OK, so that's, that's a good point. So I, I, I wrote a piece, which still has not been out there, with the title, What, large com what Companies Envy From Universities and What Universities Must Do To Evolve? OK? So every startup starts with a burst of creativity, OK? And as they go bigger and bigger, at some point, that initial spirit, spunk kind of thing, gets lost. And that's why large companies sometimes, now they are acquiring smaller companies, because they don't have within, I mean, there are experiments that people have done, OK? Uh, Google had, a, I don't know, Google X somewhere. 3M had the, for a while, the policy, 10% of your time is yours. You can do whatever you want. But then they abandoned this because we live in the real world. They have lived from quarter to quarter. But the, the creativity that drives a small enterprise somehow is lost when you have a gigantic organization with functions and Everybody has to do what he's supposed to do, and there's no room for kind of this serendipity and creative exploration. So if you want to have that, you have to fabricate the conditions for that to take place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Mr. Misosa. Uh, I'm from 20th Company. Uh, sir, you briefly mentioned that AI facilitates combinatorial creativity and only that kind of creativity. Um, how do you expect this, like new innovation in AI, to propel or deter um, a, like innovation in the future? Sorry, repeat the second part. Um, how do you expect AI to propel or hinder innovation in the future? I mean, there's no question that AI can do amazing things, okay? And, and it will be used in ways that we don't envision and it, it can help in multiple ways, OK? Um, but let me, for example, kind of back off a little bit. Uh, you can have AI, and you have, I have seen this, uh, AI that can paint, paint like, I don't know, Mark Rothko or Picasso. Who cares? I mean, Picasso happened, you move on. There, there's, no, there's no room for rediscovering the things in there. The, the thing that is the part that will be the most challenging in the future, in my view, is that for hundreds of years until now, especially after the Newtonian revolution, all the science advances that we have had, all the technology that we have now, planes, microelectronics, materials, all of that is based on science. Now, before that, people were designing steam engines before knowing thermodynamics for hundreds of years, OK? Before Sadi Carnot appeared with thermo. We, you can do technology without knowing the science, OK? But lately, everything that we have in front of us is based on understanding the basic building blocks of science. So when you have 
a complicated model producing, let's say, beyond weather, climate, okay? Uh, I do not know what goes in the model completely, but I know people who work, for example, on the aerosol component. I know them, I trust them, and I believe that all the pieces necessary are built on sci sound scientific understanding. And then you ask the model, tell me what happens, and sometimes you may be surprised. For example, when you study a model uh, involving interaction between agriculture, and water, food, energy, wow, this is super complicated. The model can give you surprising results, maybe even produce emergence. But you have the possibility of asking what if questions. You can say, how about if we change this? Let's see what happens. With AI, as now, you cannot do that. You get an answer, and you have no idea. You cannot say, explain it to me why you did this. Okay? The other part that I think we have to be prepared, and it will be solved, is that the AI models themselves, when they get to billions of parameters, can e exhibit. I don't want to get, I don't believe the idea of consciousness and. Uh, Practical considerations have to rule the discussion in here. But they can have surprising, almost emergent behavior. I mean, the classical example was AI models, okay, just by themselves, had problems multiplying two-digit numbers by two-digit numbers. Okay? But at some point, they increase in complexity and they learn it. And no one can explain why. So, the, the, the two things that have to do with lack of transparency, tell me why this happened, uh, uh, and just, just not being able to dig in the system and knowing how the system will evolve, those are issues that I think we have to pay attention from now on. Nevertheless, there are a good number of things that will be incredibly uh, transformative, and in many disciplines, uh, they, they can be turned around. For example, I, I would say in the category of the biggest success that I can think of AI, I know, Yannick Keberkidis here, is a, a problem that was considered intractable, was the problem of protein folding. Very hard. And I, I think it's AlphaGo, the program, AlphaFold. Uh, somehow, magically, that, that did. So, my, the answer to me is you have to be careful on how to use it uh, and knowing what the answers that you are getting out are based on. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. One last thing. Yeah. I'm Steve Kamaski, the uh, class of 69. We're well represented down here. I'm gonna, there you go. And we're going to introduce the shipment win in a second. Okay, but before then, I want to thank the Admiral. I want to thank uh, the Provost and uh, Captain Shoot and uh, in the class of 69 and from all of us, well, we wish our best to the class of 2024. Yeah. <laughs> the professor, thank you very much for uh, your talk. We're going to give you right now from the class of 69 our uh, challenge coin and then I'm going to turn it over to Midshipman Wynn. There you go, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Midshipman, Midshipman Wynn is going to give you something from the brigade. Yeah. Sir, on behalf of the midship, brigade of the midshipmen and the map department, we'd like to present you for a few gifts.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Let's thank Professor Otino again. Professor Otino will be right outside in the front here, and there'll be some refreshments, able to answer questions, more questions from the audience. That's it. Good night now. Thank you.